Uh, so let's start with some news um, you probably heard recently. Uh, speaking of Uber, uh, this happened. Uh, some well, this happened some time back, but this came to light uh, recently. And when I was reading this article, I was like, um, exactly what crypto did someone have to break to do this? And then as I was reading more into the article, this is what I actually read. Um, now, it's not, it, it's not like breaking of crypto or even guessing of password here. It's just stealing of password. So regardless of what your complexity of your password was, somebody, if they're just allowed to steal it, then that's it. That's keys to the front door. Nobody needs to find a back door. So funny thing here is GitHub, the part GitHub. That means somebody actually checked in the code with had secrets in it, right? Um, now, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, uh, we have done that in the past, so nothing to laugh about here. But um, the funny thing here is the second story, which kind of happened slightly in the past, like two years back or something. Um, and the, the, the funny part here is the company itself was a code repository company for other people. And their credentials got stolen. And in fact, they had a much severe uh, problem than Uber. Uber basically had a black PR mark, basically got P into PR problems, and obviously also paid the bad guys. Uh, these people had to just shut their door. They just folded as a company, right? And the problem was, basically, they had secrets that basically somehow got into wrong people's hands. They tried to bribe, uh, uh, ask for ransom, whatnot, and then at the, at the end of the day, they deleted everything and they folded as a company. So it's, it's a serious problem if you, if you do all this crypto and don't manage your keys properly. So what happens is um, all this code that we write, somewhere in the execution of the code, you require the secret to be present, to be usable, keys, passwords, whatnot. And how do you manage this, uh, uh, whatever type of secret you have when, you, when the code runs and the secret is basically made available? So over the last uh, two days, we have basically seen a lot of uh, talks talking about uh, you know, key, key management and then in, in, in key management systems and then in uh, TLS and everywhere. So um, I'll give you a very brief, uh, very, very high-level overview of what Netflix backend looks like. Um, we basically have our control plane. We have our cloud provider that we use our service, services from. We have partners that we work with. We have our content delivery network and of course our customers. Uh, we are mo mainly focused uh, for the control plane here. We have 1,000 plus applications. We have a bunch of things deployed inside. They, what the fancy word now is service mesh uh, that we have deployed. And then they, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, applications talk to each other. And then obviously in the, in the ecosystem, we have thousands of uh, uh, people who also check in their code. That makes uh, that make the applications actually go build, deploy, and run. So let's build a story. Now let's talk about some piece of code. We'll take an example, but this is just an example. You can up, you can extrapolate this and make it any secret. But let's say you have this piece of code. Now most of you probably already uh, saw the line which basically says password. And even if it's a crazy long password that some, nobody can guess, that's not the point. The point is, can somebody steal this password? So right now, it's actually sitting in the code. So sure, can we do better? Maybe we just do this. We don't put uh, the actual password in it. We actually encrypt it and then call a magic function called decrypt. And somehow expect that when this code runs, wherever it runs, this password will be decrypted and will be available so that now the code looks like this, I can make my database connection, no problem. It's slightly uh, complex than this. I'm just making uh, things simple right now. But let's say uh, this is a piece of code that we, we are going to write and deploy uh, and test. So if, you, if I put this code in Netflix, what we have is a Git repository that these unfortunate developers are uh, using for a given application for this code, and their job is to basically check out this code, run it locally before they check in, test everything. And part of that test could be to actually make that database connection. 
That means they need the password locally on their laptop when the test is running. So now, remember that magic decrypt function? That magic decrypt function needs to run on their laptop, and only on these two developers' laptop, nobody else. All right. Then you have, now they're happy, they checked in their code, there's a continuous integration system, Jenkins in our case, it basically runs their uh, build. As part of the build, they have a bunch of unit tests, they have a bunch of integration, integration tests, and those tests also talk to the database to make sure that things are right. That means the same secret, the same decrypt function needs to also work on Jenkins box. Okay, but a lot of other people's code also work on Jenkins box. So you also, also want to make sure that only that person's Jenkins job is allowed to decrypt the secret, not everybody else. All right. So now, build is happy. You're happy with the build. Now you send it to the uh, deployment system. In our case, we have an open source system called Spinnaker, pretty awesome. Um, uh, then deployment system says, all right, I'm happy. I'm going to go push everything and spin up a cluster in AWS. By the way, Netflix is 100% AWS. So we don't have anything, any data centers. But this, this particular problem will become even complex if you have hybrid system when you have, you have your own data centers and AWS or maybe some other cloud provider or hybrid. So now, how do you have that magic decrypt function actually give you the password you need to run your code in all these setups? So let's say you basically have a key management system, which is a central system. Um, and all these three different uh, places where the code is running from, they can go to this key management system and ask for uh, decryption of the password. Okay, uh, so a couple of problems here. So first of all, and, and, and this, is, this is funny because God is with me here. This happened, like the, the Spectre and Meltdown happened like a couple of weeks before I, I'm, I'm preparing to talk here. And the reason we designed this system this way was we were expecting that something like this will actually happen someday. So this is th three years back we were designing this system, and it actually happens just before the presentation, so it kind of helps. But something like this happens, right? Now, now, now what's, what's going on here is even if that key management system or key server here is pretty well protected, something like this happens. And remember, because we are in 100% AWS, this also runs on a VM which is basically running next to a random person's VM, right? So now all these secrets password that are basically coming into this uh, uh, key, key server are being decrypted and are, for whatever number of milliseconds, are in clear in the memory of the key server. All right, so that's a problem. Now, let's see if, if we have any alternatives, but can I put then the key actually in the HSM? So there are two problems. Obviously, the key is in RAM versus key is in HSM, but you cannot get away with the problem that somebody, your system just decrypted a password, database password, which is actually in the, in the RAM of that key server. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So let's summarize. We basically have now multiple places, people, other uh, you know, CI, CD um, uh, systems, applications themselves. They're all coming to this key server and basically want to get their secret. And that, this is just one example. When I say secrets at scale, we basically have 1,000 plus applications. They all, all need their uh, secrets coming from random sources. Now, in order to do the decryption, we basically have to do two steps. Remember, as I said, those two uh, developers, only those two developers, nobody else should be able to decrypt that secret because they are the ones that are managing that code and they are the only ones supposed to develop on that code. So first thing first you want to do is authenticate the request. So who's asking for uh, this decryption? So you have to know, the key server has to know who's asking for it. And then second step and more important step is to reuse the decryption key, write decryption key to do the uh, decryption. Now, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that first step of authenticating. We have to be, my team has talked about it in uh, multiple places, uh, but I'll go through it very quickly. And I have at the end uh, some resources that you can look at. Uh, for the first step. And it's not very crypto interesting in some ways. Um, 
so requester's identity. So who is requesting? So we have two types of things. We have users and we have application. In case of users, we basically have Google, uh, Google identity service that we use for our people, employees. So Google does it right, so we don't care too much about it. So internally, we use OAuth or uh, Mutual TLS when um, uh, users uh, authenticate. The more interesting part is the applications that we use, uh, AWS, uh, VMs, and then containers on top sometimes, uh, where we also use a Mutual TLS, but the bootstrapping has to happen using um, something called AWS Metadata Service. So this is where actually it uh, took us a bit of time to actually get this going because I come from embedded system background. When I had uh, complete control over my hardware, I could basically just put my key into TPM or something like that and bootstrap my system like that. In case of VMs, I don't have any control over my hardware. I actually have nothing. So when do I, where do I even start uh, giving a name to my application so that it can authenticate to someone else? So this is how it works. Uh, it's hard to see because of the color combination, but trust me, there is, a, there is something called metadata service. If you look up all the uh, documentations of AWS, you can hit this endpoint only from that VM, uh, and it spits out something like this, which is basically just a base64 for this. Now, the most interesting part there is that instance ID. It's, it's a unique ID that is basically given to your uh, virtual machine at this point. Um, and nobody else has that ID at this point. Um, but it's not very interesting when, when, when you have to write a, a policy, when you want to write a policy this application is supposed to decrypt the secret, that instance ID doesn't really help because it's, not, it's ephemeral, first of all, and B, it's not something you can put in policy. What you want to put in policy is a name of the application. So you need to do a translation from this big random looking name to something that you actually can write policy against. So what we do is we make a AWS uh, EC2 call, which basically tells me something about that instance that just got launched. And one of those things is tags, which where we put um, the application name and the version of the application and such. So now I have some information about the application's name, and then we do some background magic to do some sh uh, short-lived certificates to every application that we launch. That's not the point. The, the point is now I have the application that can identify itself. So I have, I have some um, uh, other talks that I have referenced, and feel free to uh, dig it more in, into that. The more interesting part here is the second part, uh, given the audience. Is, is, uh, now, I have one group. In this case, I have two developers, one Jenkins job, and one application. So I, if I make a group for that group, how many of our secrets are shared? I need at least one unique decryption key. That key cannot be shared with anybody else. So now, you can have groups like Alice, Bob, application one, Jenkins one, Eve, application two, application three. Eve can have some secret that basically is shared across two applications, possible. So now you have individual keys for individual uh, groups. All right. So now lo let's talk scale, because net at Netflix, everything is about scale. Let's say if you have M users and N applications, or the other way around. The maximum number of groups that you can have or expect, shouldn't say expect, have is two to the n plus n minus one. All right, so put some numbers around it. All right, let's say you have a startup, has 10 users, 10 applications. That number is million plus. All right, now let's say you hired two more people who ended up writing two extra applications. All right. Now that number suddenly went to 16 million plus. At Netflix, we have 1,000 plus applications and hundreds of people who write code. All right, so you can imagine what kind of, what kind of number of groups, combinations you can expect, right? All right, not gonna fly. Let's see. Some people will come back and say, why are you complicated, complicating this problem so much? You can just have this key server Instead of you asking for encrypted uh, uh, decryption using a given key, you use a handle and put all the stuff in the database. If you do that, then you only need one key. Because now you can have 
this database, you pull out whatever key you want, you decrypt, and then you send it. You just need one key. Sure. Now you just did this. Why? Because in the previous case, when I mentioned about Meltdown and Spectre, somebody actually had to sit there and monitor those uh, uh, passwords being decrypted and sent out, and basically siphon all those uh, secrets out. In this case, if, if the secret is in the database, it, it can be a completely passive attack. The user is not even asking for any decryption. I, I sit here, I have the master key somehow, and then I go to the database and I pull out everything. It basically becomes gold mine. Second problem with this approach is now if I have to share a secret among people, I have to first put it in this database. That means the, the, the generation part of the secret cannot be offline. And uh, there are some use cases we can talk about why uh, it's desirable to have the generation of the secret part offline, generation and protection. So let's define our goals first, because we've been talking a lot about what, what is good, what is bad. Um, what we want to achieve, we, when we started this, we want, what, want you, what, what we wanted to achieve here is, if a secret is generated by a party, is supposed to be consumed by this set of group or parties, that secret should not ever, ever be in clear except for there, for the, for the creator and for the consumers, not even the decryption server. Okay? Some stretch goals. This is how we started. Like Maybe if we can get the offline encryption part going as well, that would be really nice. Because let's say if we have a payment partner, some bank that we are working with, they need to send us some TLS keys. We would really want them to not send it to a PGP key for one of our employees if possible. Right? The guy can put that PGP private key on the laptop. Laptop gets compromised or stolen. TLS key to a bank gets stolen. That's just crazy. right? We would much rather give them a small piece of code which basically says, hey, just encrypt it using this tool. And that, that immediately just take that encrypted version and throw it in the source code, and it magically works for the group of people you are designed this to for. So desirable. Decryption service ability to observe usage pattern. So th this was something I put in the uh, stretch goals because given where Netflix is, people would really like to hack that key server, which is unfortunately managed by my team, and I want to sleep at night. So I don't want somebody to hack into that system and siphon off some sort of usage pattern that gives them some advantage over Netflix's business and pattern of business. So at least try to limit as much as possible, as in even if you get into that box, what do you really get to see? And then, of course, as scale, you should have number of keys that scale. As I mentioned, like you, you, if you do one, one key per group, you have so many groups. Can you really have those many keys that you can support? And also, the request. So now you said thousands of applications with sometimes hundreds of instances of each application um, and users. Can you really scale from request perspective? Can you really handle those many requests? Uh, and if you architect it in a way that uh, you can horizontally scale, um, that would be nice. I think yesterday somebody mentioned about being stateless. If your systems are stateless, it's very easy to horizontally scale. Just throw more boxes at it. All right. So if you see visually what we want to do is, if you have a secret creator which somehow generated the secret, we want it to just basically protect it right there, maybe on their laptop, if it's person generating secret. Um, then you have a consumer, it could be a person or an app or whatever, and then what you want is the ciphertext to be available on, in the code, and then at the runtime, it makes a query to a decryption server, uh, exchanges some messages, and at the end, you want that message to basically show up on that person's laptop or application. But at the same time, you don't want that. You don't ever want that secret to be visible in clear on the decryption server. And if possible, you want the first phase to be offline and the second phase to be online, if possible. That's the scale part. You don't want this to grow. You don't want number of keys to grow as you're, as you're adding people, as you're adding more code, as you're adding more secrets. That's not a possibility, especially in cloud. Um, 
we, we talked about million keys, 16 million keys, stuff like that. The reality is no HSM will support that kind of keys. The max I've heard is like still in thousands, right? So not possible. So what we did is did some literature survey because we wanted to meet this goal, not sure how, so we just ran, literally reading through random papers, seriously. And when, when we were going through this, we knew what we wanted, but we wanted to make sure that some math exists there that I, you, can, you can make use of. So we bumped into this paper from Asia Group 96, which is RSA-based blind signatures, but we don't really need signatures here, we need the encryption part, but because it's RSA-based, we were hoping that maybe we can tweak it <laughs> in a way that we use it for encryption. Um, so this is how we came up with, this is the setup, uh, and this is literally just taken from that paper because that's how the setup is. We didn't change any of that math. Um, um, you, have a, you, you, you can have a group ID, which is the group of people and applications together, put them together, give them some integer number, uh, and then there is a formatting function called tau, uh, and then you, you choose two primes P and Q, not, not randomly like any other RSA um, uh, parameters that you choose, uh, but there are some restrictions you have to follow. Uh, uh, it has to be co-prime and stuff like that. Um, then you have the uh, public uh, E uh, that you choose, but not, you know, uh, like uh, regular, regular uh, E, E uh, 65537 or whatnot. Once you do that, you want to do the encryption something like this. It's not regular M to the E. It's M to the E, but then you add that uh, tau with it. Now, this, this may feel like that tag-based encryption, uh, which basically E to the E tau is, uh, tau I, group ID is basically the tag. All it does is with the same modulus, it gives you different exponents, right? So what you do is, once you encrypt it, maybe offline, you have the ciphertext. Before you send the ciphertext for decryption, what you want to do is you want to blind it. But because this is not regular RSA, your blinding has to also consider the tau part in it, and the formatting function. So once you do that, it basically spits out this Z. Uh, just for visualization uh, uh, reasons, I actually say that the C is somehow inside Z. Okay, think about it as a box in a box. You had one box, which was C. You put that whole encryption box in another box. Okay, that becomes Z. Now, you send it for decryption to the server, and the server performs this, uh, which basically gives you phi. So think about the server basically inserting. Server only has the key to the inside box, not the outside box. So think of server inserting a key inside the outside box, only a hole is left to insert the key and opens the inside box, okay? So just for visualization perspective, I just put that the M is open now on, on, on the server side, but it's actually still covered on the outside box, which is fine. And then you send it over to the uh, uh, sender, and then sender knows the R, so it can perform the reverse operation and get, get the M out. So in this process, you basically did not let the server look at M. At the same time, you had everything driven through group ID. So now you can have many group IDs. You can have as many um, uh, sets of combinations of people and applications you want, and you basically you run the same math. So of course, the next question will come with, with RSA encryption, the next always question comes in the padding. So you can use any padding like OAP, KEM. We have internal uh, uh, padding, which is kind of looks like PKCS 1.5, and yes, before you go, what? Um, uh, th there, are, there are other, uh, PKCS 5, you can, you can, you can perform the, the attacks that you people have published in the past. It's basically because you don't have the authenticator. You, you, you're performing those kind of attacks where the channel is not authenticated. Yeah. Remember, our decryption happens only after the authentication happens. But again, regardless, you can have any padding scheme you want with this. That's not a problem. Now, so how did we do uh, when we wanted to achieve all these our goals? We put blind decryption behind uh, authentication. 
for stretch goals, we did actually perform this uh, in a way that it was, because it's asymmetric, you can do the uh, encryption part, part offline. And uh, because it's a stateless system with only one key, remember the whole decryption part required one D. ED was, uh, so the only thing that was secret was one D. You could now basically scale horizontally as much as you want because you can just spin up more uh, instances that have access to D and that's it. So this is the most important part. Taking it one step further. So we talked about group ID being like group of uh, applications and people, but it doesn't really have to. Because it's just a number, you can now convert this whole system into a policy that has number. So policy number one, I want to tie this secret to policy number one. That policy number one just doesn't have a whitelist of people and application. It can have any other rule inside, like don't let encryption happen or decryption happen after 2 p.m. or whatever, right? So now you can write a random policy, give it a number. As long as the number is unique, you can tie your secret into it. So now you're bleeding slightly into authorization as well, which is what we, we, we also work on. Uh, some Matthew Green actually uh, pointed out this paper to me. I've not had a chance to actually look at this, but it seems like this paper could also have similar construction that you can make and achieve similar goals. Again, I just put it out there because Matthew uh, pointed it out, but uh, I've not looked at it yet. Uh, if you have other suggestions that are welcome, we only, only want to do better. Um, so next steps are basically we want to just uh, keep the same goals, but uh, see if we can do it with uh, provable security measures, more measures, uh, uh, guarantees we can do. Probably do multi-party. Nick mentioned something about you know, where is the master key. In this case, the master key is D. Uh, we want to see if we can perform the same thing with multi-party, maybe do something as dumb as do, do this twice uh, and then and, and have the uh, key basically just XOR. And then, of course, the next step will be doing something like this with a PQ resistant uh, scheme. All right, so these are some of the resources that we uh, have put uh, for your things, and thank you. Thank you for a fantastic talk. We have just a minute or so for questions while other folks are getting mic'd up. Well, I have one. You've published so much else. Are you going to be making some of this key management software available for others to use? So we get that a lot. Um, I have a sort I, of a personal interest in No, this. yes. Uh, actually, I, want, I have patented this, but I want to also open source it because this is very useful. I, uh, a lot of people I've talked to internally, they've told me that. Um, I think it's just the engineering effort that we just need to put it, and at this point... That's not free, I get it. Yeah, yeah I, we are hiring, so <laughs> the, the, the more people we get, we'll, we'll probably, yeah. yeah. So Thank you so much. Hopefully. Thank you.